Georgia, do you want to like check your slides till Jenna's? Yeah. Ah, yeah. perfect. So I can see your notes right now. Yeah. I, I have to. That should be okay. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> you All right, like perfect. Me to leave this on? Do you like me to, to leave, leave this on? Like it's up to you. Uh, up to you guys. Whatever. Sorry, do you mean the camera? No, no, no. I mean the, the presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Leave it up. We're starting in two minutes. Yeah, that's, right, um, right, right that's totally. That's great. Thanks so much. Yeah, sometimes I try to put up the schedule, but I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why. That's why. Sometimes I've yeah. seen you putting the schedule up. No, this is exciting. Okay, so you'll be you'll be presenting that uh, that new paper. This is yeah. very big, very long story. <laughs> very long story. <laughs> It's gonna take me a while. <laughs> and a few seconds to be back. Ah, you're back. We lost you for like a minute. Ah, all right. Well, I didn't, okay. I think maybe we lost you. Oh, after. okay, it was <laughs> other way. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> this is one thing that does not happen in person, right? We don't disappear. Uh, I know. <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> but it could but be you know, different. If you ever if you ever have some problem and you forget what you're supposed to be saying, just be oh sorry I lost my connection for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good excuses, but <laughs> definitely. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, my but... camera is not working. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. 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 I'm going through a tunnel. <laughs> That's funny. And it, I do hope that we get to all start visiting each other sometime. Yeah, Sometimes but it would soon. be a pity to give up to this series. <laughs> and I hope, I mean, this is a unique opportunity, really, to keep the flow of science going. I always say we're going to, we'll keep doing it as long as people keep showing up. You know, if we ever have a day where there's only five, 10 people here, maybe then we won't want to continue. But we haven't had that. And we have, you know, as we were saying, yeah, such a great community. No, I'll be so. very sad. <laughs> <laughs> No, but so we are. So we, I would because it's uh, now it's become sort of an habit, and it's a very nice habit. <laughs> yeah, I've never had that something you know going throughout the year where you're constantly like keeping up with so much research, you know, across continents. Yeah, yeah, no, it's terrific. How much of your time does this require? Is that very demanding or? <laughs> Depends, I think. <laughs> In the beginning, when we're setting up the schedule, it's um, a time commitment. But now it's just, you know, a fun break uh, during the week, right? Once we get it going. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. So we are just about at time. I see people are going to keep trickling in for the first five minutes. Um, I've made both of you co-host. So um, all right. if anything happens, uh, that should that should take over. All right, let's go ahead and get started so we can give you the maximum amount of time. All right, mm -hmm. so welcome everybody to today's installment of the Cell Migration Seminar Series. Uh, we'll just remind you to um, stay muted during the talk and we'll hold questions until the end unless it is a um, sort of burning clarification that you need, in which case feel free to raise your hand or pop up and ask a question. All right, so today we are delighted to have Professor Giorgio Shita. Giorgio obtained his PhD from the University of Parma in Italy, and he went on to do his postdoctoral training at the University of California, Berkeley, and also at the National Cancer Institute at the NIH. So we had him here in the United States for a little while. But from there, he uh, returned back to Italy and has since held principal investigator and professor positions at the European Institute of Oncology and at the FIRC Institute of Molecular Oncology and now at the University of Milan. So Giorgio's primary research interest has been dissecting basic cell mechanisms of cell migration and invasion following signaling leading to spatial and temporal regulation of actin dynamics. So he's obviously a perfect fit for this online series. Uh, and more recently, he's been investigating the impact of endocytic networks on the biomechanics of collective cell migration, tumor plasticity, and dissemination. And he's been focusing specifically on tissue level, solid to liquid uh, transitions underlying human breast ductal adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma progression. And so um, if 
any of you are familiar with uh, some of the things that I'm interested, you'll know that uh, Giorgio is, is um, someone that I've been following for many years now, and I'm so excited to be welcoming him here today. All right, and with that, take it away. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you, Pita. I mean, I always I was just thank you guys for organizing this terrific series, which has become a very dear to my heart habit uh, once a week. So it's terrific. So without further ado, what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, actually a story that is not yet published, uh, mainly, and uh, per pertain tissue fluidification, as you will see in invisible scans, and the consequence that this might have uh, on uh, transcriptional rewiring, and particularly how it may promote a sigasting mediated transcriptional rewiring in invisible scans carcinoma, and we can discuss what would be the consequence potentially of this. All right, so that's clear, and then particularly in the audience, I don't need to underline this, the mechanical uh, properties of uh, cell and tissues have become uh, overarching determinant of cell fate and uh, um, physiology in pathology and in pathology, particularly during uh, less uh, carcinogenesis, as you will see. Uh, but like in normal tissue development, for instance, uh, typically tissue tend to uh, become dense, slip pack with cells, uh, to reach a sort of like rigidity state and uh, uh, which is can be um, uh, viewed as a jam state. On the contrary, when the tissue needs to repair a wound or to, for instance, invade into small narrow gaps, if it acquires fluid-like property, this is uh, facilitated in its ability to adapt to uh, uh, environmental condition. And this is very much uh, like uh, the uh, um, type of behavior that like, uh, collective group of, of individual being adopting in order to uh, adapt to various different challenges like in, in this uh, uh, um, ships, uh, grazing ship going for a channel. Um, one, before actually I start, let me, oops, let me just thank you all the people that did uh, uh, actually the work that I'm gonna be telling you about. Uh, so this is the lab right now, it's like actually Chiara's left uh, but clearly contributed the work and which has been mainly carried out by Emanuela and Andrea. Uh, and, and there are a lot of people because there's a lot of collaboration that are involved in this process. In particular, I'd like to point out the collaboration with the uh, physicist at the University of Milan, led by uh, Roberto Giovini and now by Fabio Giavazzi, the uh, electron microscopy uh, with Galina, the pathologist, uh, which play an important role, as well as the uh, uh, bioinformatic analysis. All right. The context in which I'm going to be discussing tissue fluidification is the um, progression of, of a solid carcinoma, which has been uh, beautifully outlined, or the mechanical features that actually underline the various step of progression of, of um, um, solid carcinoma, which is beautifully uh, summarized by this very nice, um, uh, if you haven't read it, uh, review by uh, Jackie Goes. And basically, every step of uh, tumor dissemination and uh, metastasis formation involves mechanical uh, alteration from the invasion to the extravasation to the uh, ability to support shear stress in the circulation to extravasation and then the CD of metastasis. Uh, the early step of carcinogenesis are particularly important or the mechanical aspect of the early step of carcinogenesis are particularly important. And again, I just you know, use a couple of uh, one example by a couple of example, one that I'm going to be telling you more in detail. The first one is this uh, very nice paper by um, uh, Peter Friedel. Actually, we had sent the paper back to back uh, a few years ago, um, uh, which has uh, uh, showing that uh, in the early phases of local dissemination, the factors like cell cell adhesion and, and confinement exerted by extracellular matrix actually uh, exert a set of mechanical uh, alteration that actually impose a, a mode of motility of collective flocking, or actually I would say solid fluid, solid rather than fluid uh, mode of locomotion, which can be uh, very nicely captured by particle image velocimetric analysis. One, and this is very much, again, just to resonate the behavior of collective entity, uh, uh, the work that was awarded with the Nobel Prize this year by uh, to Giorgio Parisi, who has been studying among many other things, the behavior of this complex system, like this uh, motility of the Stalin flocks. And we have been exploiting some of the analysis that has been carried out in order to be, uh, to apply this analysis to collective mo motion of uh, uh, breast carcinoma. 
Um, but the case I'd like to discuss in particular is our doctor carcinoma in situ. These are breast doctor carcinoma. They, they will grow into the confinement of the dots um, and they tend to grow at high packing density, which uh, inside and confined within the mammary duct. This condition exert uh, tremendous mechanical stress, mechanical compressive stress that impact on the physical property of the breast carcinoma, which frequently end up adopting a doctor carcinoma, typical, well, which a pathologist call of comedotype uh, uh, appearance, where cells are clearly packed and dense, and they, you would argue that they would look like gem and rigidify. Um, and remarkably, this type of tumors, which represent about 20% of all the breast carcinoma uh, prognosis that are provided, 70% uh, of these guys will never progress, actually will regress or stay as, as indolent lesions, suggesting that the extreme packing density of this uh, lesion exert tumor suppressing function. However, in about 25 to 30% of cases, those tumors actually are able to overcome the compressive or the uh, crowdiness mediated uh, compression of this extremely packed and dense lesion to acquire, we would argue and propose and, and try to demonstrate fluid-like property, which enable them to invade into the surrounding uh, local matrix. And the question we were concerned about is, uh, is to understand how the biochemical and, bio and biophysical uh, interaction that drives on the one end the extreme packing and on the other, the fluidification of, uh, of tissue is regulated within cells. And one fantastic framework that Jeff Redberg revived uh, and put forward is the notion, and, and Jennifer worked a lot on, uh, is the notion of uh, gemming transition. This is uh, a, 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 a clearly a collective behavior, which is uh, shown here and epitomized by, uh, by uh, a normal mammary epithelial layer of cells, which are seeded at high density. At the beginning, as, as the movie will run again, you see that the cells actually display fluid-like behavior. They are able to rearrange their position and their um, locomotion one with respect when, to each other. Uh, the certain critical density motility sees, the tissue rigidify, and the system become solid and rigid. And this, can be capture some of the parameters that can be uh, uh, utilized to capture this type of transition are depicted on the right, where you have like particle image of symmetric analysis, which is uh, depicted by the uh, uh, extent of, of, of uh, vector velocity that you see. And then there is a color code in there embedded where uh, regions that have that display the same angular and extent of velocity as the overall average of the monolayer are depicted in yellow. The one that have a vector velocity that is opposite is depicted in blue, which capture a, a feature of a system that is transitioning from a phase that is solid to a phase that is liquid and vice versa, which is the emergence of dynamic heterogeneity. All right, work by many people uh, uh, which are particularly mentioned here, um, uh, have shown that uh, uh, you can actually uh, interpret the behavior of collective epithelial entity, in particularly through the length of uh, uh, jamming transition, which is controlled by a set of very simplified um, biochemical, biochemical and biophysical parameters, including uh, adhesion, cell shape, and, cell, and, and shape variance, as it was beautifully shown by um, um, Atia work here, um, uh, or uh, cell intrinsic cell motility. And the system actually is held in a sort of like a, a, a non stable state, and it's easy to tip the point from either a solid jam static uh, system to a, or to a, a fluid like one. And one particularly, a uh, uh, couple of different points that I like to make here. One is the fact that this system tend to have like uh, uh, once they are jammed and solid, uh, they displace very limited uh, fluctuation. Uh, whether they are cellular fluctuation or giant fluctuation. Conversely, systems that are becoming jamming and fluidized, they display this very uh, large giant fluctuation that is reflected also in various uh, alteration of cell shape. In addition, the system uh, actually works very nicely to try to interpret the behavior of collective entity. Uh, either uh, you can think that any uh, 
normal mammary epithelial cell would actually tend to undergo a jamming rigidity state uh, that is essential to allow the tissue to develop its property like rigidity, but also tensile state. On the other end, uh, if you are a tumor, you like to overcome the condition that impose such restriction and to become fluid uh, in order to metastasize. And remarkably, early work that has nothing to do with German transition has shown that, for instance, late stage RBB2, which is the most one of the most potent um, oncogen in breast carcinogenesis, display a compact, dense state. And if you look at the ability of this tumor to metastasize, significant reduce with respect to um, uh, much early uh, and uh, less dense and more, I would argue, ungen lesion. All right, one of the major questions we are concerned when we stumble upon this type of uh, phenotype is what are the molecular determinants that actually control germ transition and whether an owl cell actually can do that. And so the whole thing started with a very simple experiment. We are cell biologists and the experiment is depicted here. What you see here again is the normal mammary epithelial cell monolayer that is CD at a particularly high density. And then if I run the movie, you'll see that uh, um, these control cells are in a dense, rigid, uh, 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 solid-like state where motility is basically prevented. Conversely, the simple expression by doxycycline, these are lentivirally infected cells that express an endocytic factor, lab 5A, which I, we can discuss about in a second what uh, it might be doing, is sufficient to reawaken the collective locomotion of an otherwise completely jammed and static and rigid monolayer. You can measure this by measuring the root mean square velocity. You can also measure the extent of collective locomotion by plotting the correlation function of the velocity vector as a function of the distance between, uh, in this case, object the, the object are cells, which display a very large correlation length that extend up to one millimeter, indicating that there are more than 50 cells that together, they sense the motion of their neighbors and they move in a highly coordinated fashion. And the simple overexpression of an endocytic, a master regulator of endocytosis, I would call, as actually Marino Toth, Marino Zerial taught us, RAB5 is indeed essential for the generation of early endosome, which is a critical sorting station where any kind of internalization pathway at the cellular level is uh, directed in order for the then uh, cargo to decide whether to go back by recycling or being degraded. And RAP5 is absolutely essential for the formation of early ends. So actually, there are three genes, but we can discuss about that later. All right. So I want to go quickly because this is published. And, and so, of course, we ask the question, how does RAP5, the simple endocytic gene, does that, does cause this like we have dramatic reawakening of a ballistic collective locomotory behavior, which can be captured by uh, staining or by expressing uh, H2B uh, fluorescent uh, nuclei. Uh, and, and the bottom line of what RAP5 does, it does a lot of different things. First of all, it impacts on the junctional um, quadrant turnover, junctional strength, junctional morphology. The, the, there is an increase actually a reduction of intercellular space and increase of cell cell contact. At the same time though, uh, the major junction of protein ecadirin that we tested uh, is undergoing fast turnover. That allows to understand why, despite the fact that these cells that express cup fire and are fluidized, displays larger interaction surfaces, they still capable by turning over fast junctional molecule to exchange their neighbors. In addition to this, the cells undergo very large density and volume fluctuation, which I come back uh, because it's going to be a very critical point later on in the discussion, and they extend coordinated, oriented, cryptic lamellipodium protrusion, where I use the word cryptic because they extend underneath the neighboring cells, but they display all the features of a typical lamellipodia, which in the cell migration field, of course, everyone would create the ability of the cell to move in a coordinated way. And all this uh, com factor combined, and we can be captured by a biophysical model uh, where um, a monolayer, which is a uh, um, um, uh, model based on a vertex model, where the critical parameter of the perimeter versus square root of the area, so the shape of a cell, 
uh, and the ability of each cell to orient its locomotion with respect to its neighbor. Those conditions are sufficient to capture a situation where the monolayer move in a, what we call flocking or fluid, flowing liquid locomotive behavior, and uh, uh, which is characterized by the fact that you have a coexistence of this long range collective locomotive behavior that accounts for the correlation function of the velocity vector that are very large. Now, and at the same time, you have like local cell rearrangement. All right. Uh, biochemically and molecularly, we have shown uh, that uh, this in part is due to the fact that LAP5, by increasing the internalization rate of a specific receptor, actually a variety of different receptors, but in this case of the AGF receptor, and by increasing the number of endosomal uh, particles, vesicles that are uh, present in the cells, enables the activation or the increase of a sort of a quantum-like signaling that has been proposed to occur at the level of endosome, which enhance ultimately the activation of ERK1 and 2, which in turn phosphorylate the wave complex, the branching actin polymerization machinery, accounting for the ability of this cell to extend larger, more frequent oriented protrusion, which is essential for the uh, floating fluid mode of locomotion that we are detecting here. And indeed, inhibition of any part of this pathway, including inhibition of endocytosis, actually is a non clacken dependent endocytic process. We can discuss this if you're interested in pairs flocking through locomotive behavior. So we are in a cancer subology, I'm interested in cancer subology, so we immediately turn to try to understand what are the biophysical, or actually the pathophysiological consequence of this flocking fluid transition mode, this phase transition. And in a set of experiments that again, I like to summarize because they're published, what we show is that um, if you, instead of setting or looking at 2D collective locomotive behavior, we are uh, concerned with the 3D um, spheroid uh, weight of locomotion, which can be very nicely captured by generating cells that express as in this case, life act GFP as a marker of uh, acting dynamic and M cherry H2B. But the, in this particular case, it uh, is done simply to be able to visualize the type of locomotion that occurs in this spheroid. These spheroid are generated in low attachment, but they are transferring. You have to imagine that those are completely embedded in a very thick collagen and dense extracellular matrix that sort of recapitulate the type of density of accessorial matrix that a breast carcinoma would encounter uh, as, a, uh, as a consequence of the typical desmoplastic reaction that occurs. And the expression, the induction of R5 is sufficient to elicit this persistent angular rotational mode. Um, actually, we have analyzed uh, individual cell lochometry behavior within this spheroid. We can show there is a graded uh, fluidification from the center to the periphery, the external layer gets melted, exert large traction forces on the extracellular matrix, which contribute to remodeling of the extracellular matrix, ultimately enable the spheroid to become highly invasive. And the type of invasion they undergo is a collective invasive behavior. This can be observed also in uh, ex vivo tumor tissue slices, as is depicted here. Here we inject the same doctor carcinoma or DCIS-like uh, a derivative of mcf -DNA into the mammary fat bed, take slices of the tumor, exposes either to doxycycline to induce fat 5 gene and then look at their dynamic behavior. And uh, it becomes very obvious that this is sufficient to uh, express or to induce the expression of the fat 5 transgene and to uh, uh, induce large motility strain which are a remarkable reminiscent of the collective flocking food mode of locomotion that we have seen in 2D setting. Um, genetically, or in a, through a molecular genetic type of approach, we can use xenograph model to actually monitor the critical step in the transition from a doctor carcinoma confined lesion, which is characterized by this surrounding myopithelial layer which eventually will progress 
to become an invasive total carcinoma with the loss of my epithelial layer and overt invasion that can be detected. If we inhibit the up 5 a activity by expression of dominant negative, we, we severely delay this type of transition. Right? All this enable us to propose the following mode, mo model whereby flocking fluid motility may actually for a number of factors that are all uh, implies or entails mechanical perturbation, which allows a collective entity, these are the white gem static indolent to escape the tumor suppressive gem environment of data carcinoma in situ and acquire invasive property. And this can be observed also in human data carcinoma. Uh, what you see here on, uh, on the right are, is actually a data carcinoma uh, in situ with local invasive buds, of, uh, uh, invasive buds and the staining in brown uh, is detecting the level of expression of endogenous rock 5 which is uh, frequently deregulated in a graded-like fashion right at the site where invasion occurs. All right, this is where we stand. Georgios, yeah. uh, fantastic. I um, I know we said we're gonna hold questions to the end, but we actually have a couple that are on the first part of your talk. So is it okay if we ask those now? Sure, sure, okay. excellent. Great, I'm afraid everyone's gonna start pouring in with a million of them. So we'll see how many we can get through <laughs> and then we'll let you get to the new stuff. Um, sure. So Haroon is asking uh, how much of the jamming effect depends on the inherent tumor heterogeneity. If you were to develop monoculture, culture, monoclonal cultures, excuse me, would the jamming be more or less prominent than from the mixed populations that are derived from the tumor? Oh, that's, that's an excellent, excellent question. We are actively working on this because we have the possibility to create our heterogeneous cell culture now, because by exploiting uh, the lab 5 transgene, we can intermix cells that are genetically, let's say, let me call this, but it's not a, a completely pro proper jammed uh, with respect and combine and mix them with the cells that are rough expression and thereby have a tendency to be unjammed. And now we can, we can do various ratio. So we, are, uh, we have seen that there is, um, once the unjammed cell form a percolating network, the entire system flocks. And we are exactly studying how percolation transition um, overlap or correlate with the jamming transition and see what are the features there, which would be particularly relevant in the context of the, um, of, of the heterogeneous composition of uh, uh, human breast carcinoma, which clearly are gonna be composed of a heterogeneous set of cells that might or may not display the feature that allows them to unjam. Thank you, Giorgio. Our uh, next question is from Benoit Ladu. He's asking, how do you explain the non-monotonic behavior of the velocity in RAF5 cells? Uh, is it due to large increase in the intermediate densities? No, it's not due to alteration in density. It's due to a biochemical, uh, you'd be disappointed, Benoit, uh, uh, to a biochemical effect. Because what RAF5 does is to uh, promote a massive internalization in this case of the EGF receptor, and EGF is absolutely essential. So the activation of the EGF and the epidermal factor receptor is absolutely essential to elicit or to allow flocking locomotion to occur. So the constant expression of ROP5 by internalizing the receptor reduces the amount of cell surface EGF receptor and the cell become unable to respond to the EGF that is added to the medium. Uh, and so it's not, it's not the EGF itself because we did the experiment where we re-added the EGF, but nothing happens. You need to turn off for five, allow the EGF receptor to go back to the surface. And then you see again, the um, dynamic collective behavior. All right, fantastic. We have two more and then we'll let you get to, to the next part uh, from okay. Claire Waterman. Uh, she wants to know, uh, does inhibiting RAB5A induce upregulation of EMT markers such as Vimentin? Ah, interesting. Actually, it's rather the opposite. So uh, the, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to show all the data, but the overexpression of RAB5, which is associated to the uh, acquisition of flocking free transition, induces a partial EMT state where you have an upregulation of ECADIRIN, of ENCADIRIN, sorry, no, no alteration of ECADIRIN, alteration of I can't remember now the transcription factor. It should be 
uh, snail one, uh, vitamin is upregulated. Uh, and uh, we can discuss as to why that may occur later. Uh, I, Claire is okay. correcting it, saying that, yeah, she meant activating RAF5 instead of inhibit. Okay, the next Same question. answer, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let me add one thing. So we also know if we inhibit this partially empty state, we do not inhibit flocking fluid locomotory behavior. Mm -hmm. We inhibit something else that is re relevant for the uh, biological property of these flocking fluid uh, cells that you see will acquire. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question is from Kolade. Uh, he's wondering how are the cryptic lamellipodia coordinated? I love the word cryptic there. <laughs> Quantitative. That's the, the other one. So we, we, have, we have used like, well, as, uh, uh, so what we do is to express when we want to quantitate uh, cryptic lamellipodia, mosaically expressing life act uh, positive cells. So you can mm -hmm. actually uh, define by uh, the contour of cell very easily. You can define by turf analysis, specifically uh, the level of extension of lamellipodia, particularly in MCF10, which form a very nice uh, regular monolayer, uh, and, and, and so uh, then we apply ADAPT, which is uh, um, a, um, a pipeline of analysis which identify the cell contour and automatically define the extension of protrusion. The uh, you can then measure the orientation, you can measure the rate of protrusive activity, the persistence, uh, and all this kind of feature. And all this is done with respect to the group of cell that is moving. So we have to take into account also uh, this flocking fluid swirl of locomotory behavior that are occurring. Thank you so much. We'll let you go forward. And all right. So the, the next part is uh, so whether this traumatic uh, dynamic behavior has any long term consequence. When I talk about long term consequence, it's not the right uh, term. I'm talking about consequence that have an impact on the transcription state of this now. Uh, reawoken um, uh, motile cells. And so we did the obvious. We started to address this by comparing the transcriptional profile of fluidized either normal mammary epithelial cell or the oncogenic MCFTNA Dr. Casinoma in situ, which I call DCIS.com cell right now, and then compare the various transcriptional profile under condition that we know these are very jam dense monolayer that are either static and solid, the control or fluid and dynamic, there are five expressing cells. And the transcriptional difference was remarkably telling immediately something because the most striking upregulated, uh, which for a while actually caused a bit, a, a large headache, uh, but as you can see, is like the, you have an upregulation of all the interferon related uh, gene or what we call the interferon stimulating gene pathway. This type of signature occurs in all the cells so far we have tested it, except with a couple, including uh, other model of DCIS like the SUM225, the murine 41 cells, which is a triple negative murine carcinoma, or more recently we have tested tubo cells, which is an ER2 positive again, urine carcinoma, uh, and ACAT cells, normal mammary epithelial cells, and invariably you have an upregulation of this interferon stimulating gene set of, uh, of genes. And the remarkable thing is that the upregulation is very large. I mean, you can look, and I'm sure that you're attentive, but uh, on the y-axis of this graph on the bottom is, is log 10. So you have like upregulation of uh, of 100 to 1,000 fold of some of these genes, which are critical core of the signature. A signature that also resonates, or that is overlaps with the so-called cytosolic DNA sensing pathway. So a innate immunity pathway that is upregulated uh, following the presence of DNA or a nucleotide in the cytoplasm, and I'll discuss this in a second, because this cytosolic DNA sensing pathway was the key for us to try to make sense of what's going on. One of the, there are many sensors of DNA in the cytoplasm, including the Rig1 pathway or RNA in the, uh, in the cytoplasm, including the Rig1 and dump-like uh, processes, uh, but 
One of the most interesting one uh, uh, was, is the so-called cigastin um, axis. Cigas is nothing else than an enzyme that binds double-stranded DNA. Once, particularly, is present in the cytosol. And obviously, in normal condition, you would not like to have DNA in the cytosol because it's one of the most potent innate immune regulator that you may uh, find. What CIGAS does is to recognize the double strand DNA. Once form a complex, gets activated its enzymatic activity, which generate the production of a CIGAMP, a denucleotide, uh, <clears throat> which in turn act as a second messenger, canonical second messenger, leading to activation of STING, which is this stimulator of, um, this <clears throat> of interferon gene, which is generally localized in the R, but once CIGAMP are increased, becomes um, relocalized to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the Golgi and uh, activi its activity is enhanced, leading to the phosphorylation of a number of kinases, which will eventually will, will phosphorylate the so-called transcription, it's a master transcription factor for the regulation of this interferon stimulating or cytosolic DNA response genes, IRF3. Uh, and that leads in turn to the upregulation of a set of gene signature. This is exactly the one that we identify in the RAP5 fluidized tissue. Before I show you wh wh what we did about this, let me, let me do a detour, a slight detour of this, uh, because we asked the question whether even this interferon stimulating gene signature, this transcription rewiring was related to the um, single cell or the simple expression of five or was, or was instead depending on the uh, flocking fluid locomotory and jamming condition, which are typically an emergent property of a cell collective. And indeed, uh, RAP5 is capable, but at very low level, to activate the ISG in single sparse cells. But this activation becomes prominent, robust, and dramatic once the system is induced to flock as in jam compressed monolayer. We can also test one additional mechanism, uh, which is we have shown early on that even I, the simple hypotonic stimulation of uh, uh, a monolayer is sufficient to elicit uh, flocking fluid locomotory behavior. And indeed, in absence of RF5, we see an upregulation not only of flocking fluid locomotory behavior, but also of ISG. But if we combine hypotonic and RAP5 expression, now we have a synergistic, or I'm not sure I call it synergistic, we certainly have an enhanced activation. So all this indicates that you, you need to, at least to agree, you need the flocking locomotory behavior of a compressed monolayer plus the expression of a five in order to elicit this dramatic um, activation of this transcriptional dependent innate immune response. We ask you, obviously, with the, uh, the question whether all this was related to the activation of cigastin pathway. And we did that in the obvious way that cell biology do by either pharmacologically or um, molecular genetically blocking each of the member of the cigastin pathway, uh, which is depicted in this, uh, <coughs> uh, in, this, uh, in this graph on the right. And invariably, whenever we perturb or inhibit the activity of the of either sting, CIGAS, TBK, or uh, IRF3, but even RF9 and STAT1, STAT3, we can discuss this later as to what uh, this uh, occurs. We have a dramatic down regulation of the interferon stimulating gene signature pathway in absence of alteration of flocking fluid locomotory behavior. Uh, so, pointing to the fact that the order of event that we like to think are occurring, that you have rap, uh, compressive state, up five activation, flocking fluid locomotory behavior, a set of changes that I'll discuss in a second, that eventually lead to ISG, uh, to CIGAS activation, ISG uh, stimulation, um, um, and not the other way around. And this is just a summary of the table. So of course, all this begs the question, how the hell this flocking fluid locomotory behavior um, do this and how they all deactivate the cigastin pathway. And here we have to go back to some observation that we had in the past. This is worse, the work that we have done in collaboration with Wei, Wei Miao Yu. What you see are cells that express ECA during GFP. These are actually MCF DNA, but the same 
occurs in, an, in DCIS. And by um, applying a pipeline of analysis, where you actually monitor the fluctuation of cell area, which is equivalent in this particular case to cell volume, because the height of the cells is uh, not different from controller roughly, you see that the cells undergoing large briefing and fluctuation in their cell shape and cell size, which we reason may actually indicate that uh, this large flat cell fluctuation and density fluctuation may actually be transferred to the nuclei of the cells. Uh, and so we set out to assess whether this, this was the case. And again, Fabio Giavazzi and Stefano Villa and Roberto Cervino, they set up this pipeline of analysis where they automatically track the changes in shape of cell nuclei. Uh, and it's easier to see under this condition because what is easy to see is that there are five expressing cells and they go very uh, large um, uh, changes in cell nuclear area, uh, which can be captured by mean square displacement of these, uh, of the changes and one can obtain information about the strain rate at which control and the five expressing free dice monolayer are subjected to, indicating that indeed the level of fluctuation that we observe is, is immediately transferred to the nuclei, which are subjected to large uh, fluctuation. This, interesting enough, when we look back at the transcription of the profile, is accompanied by a significant regulation of the level of landing B1. Uh, and of the protein level. All right, now, now we have like cells that fluctuate a lot, exert me presumably mechanical stress that is transferred to the nuclei in a condition where the nuclei envelope is like weakened by the downregulation of lamin one which suggested immediately as the possibility that this fluidized monolayer may actually be more prone to nuclear envelope rupture, which one could be one of the source of cytosolic DNA sensed by cigars. So we set up an experiment, actually this is done by Andrea in the lab, Palamidesi, uh, who actually illuminated and ruptured the nuclear envelope. And now in cigars expressing cell, you can see the accumulation of the site of rupture of the nuclear envelope of, of cigars itself. As typical perinuclear dot, because cigars in interface cell is primarily cytoplasmic and can sense uh, DNA once the DNA leaks out. And of course, we apply this type of analysis in fixed or live cells, and just show this type of experiment in control and fluidized monolayer and count the number of cellular accumulating SIGAS dot, which are not only indicative of the fact that you might have rupture of nuclear envelope and leakage of cytosolic DNA, but we can also measure actually the product of the enzymatic activity of cigars, which is significantly increased in this free dice layer. We also wanted to have a direct visualization of this, of whether this foci of cigars would coincide region where the nuclear envelope is weakened and actually rupture. And we did that by, uh, thanks to Galina Vesnosenko uh, uh, in the lab, in, in the Institute, and Sasha Mironov, who actually set up a beautiful I mean, the amazing electromicroscopy um, system uh, of uh, correlative light electron microscopy tomography, where you focus on the SIGAS foci and then process the same cells for electromicroscopy, reconstruct what you see. Actually, this is a gold stain with um, GFP, with anti GFP antibody, and you see the accumulation of SIGAS at this site of. Uh, uh, DNA density, which actually correspond and are associated to region where the, both the inner and the outer nuclear envelope is ruptured, uh, enabling the SIGAS now to sense this condensed chromatinized, and you will see presumably damaged DNA. All right, but this is not the whole thing, because the other thing we notice is that RAP5 display feature of conical stretch cell state. Uh, and that was inspired by a set of observations done by Sarah Wickstrom, um, where uh, it was shown that following mechanical stress in, in our case was uh, subjecting cells to constant cycle of stretching and release. Cells actually mount a mechanoprotective type of response. 
which implies changing expression of limin, uh, perinuclear formation of actin ring that, that sort of act as a cage, try to, con to confine and keep the integrity of the nuclei, um, and a set of alterations that are nuclear intrinsic and are related to alteration in chromatin remodeling, and in particular, the accumulation of heterochromatin marks uh, and enlarged nuclear area and um, surface tension nuclear envelope. Uh, actually, this is the paper that I was very inspiring for us by Sarah Wickstrom, where, who shows that actually heterochromatin living nuclear soft in, in this case protect the genome against mechanical stress. And those are the old feature that actually we wanted to address whether we were uh, seeing something of nuclear mechanoprotective mechanism. And indeed, the first thing was to look at nuclear size. Uh, and it, does, uh, it was very obvious that nuclear size is increased. What is very remarkable is the response of the acting structures in this uh, fluidized monolayer, which, well, of course, the cells are becoming elongated in line with the notion that uh, you deviate from the canonical pentagonal hexagonal shape uh, once a system becomes fluidized. But more prominently is the presence of this acting ring, which are uh, permanent, I mean permanent, permanent until we look at the level of expression of phi and very prominent, and which have been interpreted as a, a, a reaction of cell that tried to really cage the nuclei for preserving its integrity. And uh, at the inner side of, of the nucleus, we could also observe an accumulation of these H3K27 trimethyl marks, which is deposited by PRC2 complex, which is as shown to be um, localized, well, which we show it is primarily localized the periphery and has been associated to uh, a response that tends to rigidify and make the nuclei more rigid in order to resist this mechanical deformation. And indeed, if we inhibit PRC2 element like SUS12 and EZH2, we significantly decrease the, this type of response. All this, well, let me skip this. We can go back to this. This is related to H3K9 trimethylation, where we see changes related to the lamin associated um, methyl. Uh, uh, nine trimethylation, which are probably indicative again of a mechanogenomic response. But all these are mechano, uh, we, we reason that this might be mechanoprotective strategy associated to an increase in nuclear rigidity. And so we wanted to measure this. And the first set of measurements were done again, thanks to the fantastic work of Fabio Giavazzi and Roberto Ciardino and Stefano Villa, where they reason in the following way. They want to correlate the fluctuation in density at the cellular and monolayer level with the fluctuation in area of the nuclei. And then um, plot this fluctuation in cell area with respect to the fluctuation of cell nuclei. In order to do that, they did uh, an analysis for PAV of the divergence, which uh, um, um, is represented in these upper panels, where I actually can identify region of compression because the, the vector, uh, velocity vector, uh, flow inward with respect to region of dilation, uh, where the velocity vector actually flow outward. And they computed the divergence, the, the root mean square of the divergence, which is significantly larger in the RAP5 cells, um, which can be used as, for a set of uh, pipeline analysis to have an indication of how much each individual cells undergo fluctuation. And then they plot the strain, the rate, uh, of changes of uh, cell area with respect to the uh, nuclear strain rate changes obtained by the pipeline of analysis that I showed you before. And remarkably, everything uh, collapses into a linear relationship with the one critical factors that the RAP5 expressing cell display a, a slope that is significantly lower than control, indicating for the same type of, of cellular deformation, their nuclei undergo, is more resistant to this deformation, undergo less changes in shape, suggesting that the nuclei may be more rigid. So we wanted, because also the reviewer asked for this, and we have but finished this, provide additional evidence that that's what's going on in uh, fluidized tissue. The first set of evidence came from atomic force microscopy measurement, where we measure the rigidity exploiting the and spring property of 
an AFM probe, which is twofold higher in rad fire express in cell. We know that, that the contribution rigidity comes from many different features, including nuclear rigidity as well as cytoplasmic um, um, features. However, we, in collaboration with Christina Avas, and I screwed up her last name, we actually measure uh, or try to obtain uh, an indication of the um, rheological property of cell cytoplasm in control and five cells exploiting these gems, which are um, uh, homo multidimeric fluorescent nanoparticles that self assembles. And the motion of this, uh, of this particle can provide information about their mean square displacement, as well as the coefficient of diffusivity in the cytoplasm of control versus fluidized tissue, which is not that different as you, as you see suggesting that maybe what we are really showing is like an increase in nuclear rigidification rather of the overall rigidification of the entire cell or monolayer. We also did a number of other experiments. I'll try to go quickly. One was to subjecting monolayer to a biaxial defined stretch and measure the changes in shape of nuclear shape. And again, we observe a variation which is in the order of twofold um, in the case of RAP5, indicative that the RAP5 nuclei may be more rigid. We perform this uh, very neat type of experiment in collaboration with the, uh, Paolo Maiure um, in the lab, where we actually subject cells to pass uh, passively through small narrow gap and measure the extent of nuclear deformation that uh, control and RAP5 cells undergo under this condition. And once again, we see a factor of two in the rate of deformation, uh, indicative of suggesting that the Rapfire expressing cell nuclei may be more rigid. And finally, we look uh, at uh, a parameter that was inspired by work uh, done by M Matthew Piel uh, and Lomakin, uh, which is uh, measuring the nuclear contour at the perimeter uh, with respect to an idealized um, a circle on a nuclear contour. Then you can uh, express what is called the excess of perimeter. Um, and if, if you have a value that is close to one, you have a very folded, probably floppy uh, nuclei. If you have a value close to zero, you have like a rigidify, almost perfectly uh, circular uh, nuclei. And this is what, and so we measure this in control and RAP5 doesn't take a lot of quantification to see that the RAP5 cells are larger and they seem to be more dense. And indeed we are studying right now and I have not done the analysis, we have not done the analysis, the fluctuation of nuclear envelope um, tension by expressing uh, GFP mass spring, which is, as you will see in a second, is localized very nicely on the nuclear envelope. And we are measuring the extent of this nuclear fluctuation, assuming or, or trying to obtain indication that indeed the nuclei are maybe more, or the nuclear envelope is rigidified under this condition. All right, all this to point out that the other thing that might happen in the cells um, is that um, despite all the mechanoprotective strategy that cells enact in order to protect the nuclei, the nuclei may actually be subjected to increase of the DNA in the nuclei to increase DNA damage. And indeed, this is the case. Uh, we measure gamma H2 axis a proxy of nuclear uh, of DNA damage. 53 BP1 foci gives exactly the same value, so they have increased DNA damage. You, you can measure DNA damage in a, in a more appropriate fashion by measuring the, com, the extent of comet tail, um, uh, and it's a sort of like um, agarose-based assay of uh, uh, DNA in the cells, and the, comic, the extent of comet tail is an indication of the extent of DNA damage, which is about three to well, two to three times higher in the rab five expressing cell. And of course we use uh, irradiation with the phi uh, gray uh, as, as a positive control. So bottom line, let me summarize everything I told you. That the flocking fluid mo lo locomotion leads to dramatic mechanical perturbation, which are transferred to the nuclei. The nuclei are mechanically deformed. Uh, they despite mount and mechanoprotective response, but eventually this uh, nuclear deformation, reduction of lamin B1 level, formation of an actin ring, alteration of the heterochromatin in state, which are all mechanoprotective response. But despite this, they fa it fails, and some of the nuclei envelope 
leak, uh, breaks under goes rapture, uh, exposing cytosolic uh, nuclear DNA to cytosolic C gas, leading to C gas steam activation pathway and uh, interferon stimulating gene transcription signature. So this was fine. And I have two, two, two minutes more. I'll just show you, is this relevant in a real pathophysiological context? Uh, and so we did a bunch of experiments using mouse xenograft as well as analysis of human data carcinoma in situ. The first one was the most striking one, and I'll show you immediately. Uh, so what you see here are data carcinoma in situ injected into the mammary fat bed, and the staining that you see is cigars, which has this typical appearance once is activated as a crescent around the nuclei as formation of nuclear dots. This is histopathological analysis. And we can count these dots uh, in the Rafi expressing DCIS. Um, we can look at the gamma H2X under this condition, which is significantly elevated in a situation where Rafi 5 is overexpressed. And then we can do the same in human breast carcinoma, actually in DCIS, which have local region of infiltration, as it is shown here. And once again, let me point out to the fact that CGAS is perinuclear accumulating, is accumulating close to the nuclei in dots in where? In regions where RAP5 is elevated, gamma H2X is elevated, right at the site where local invasion is about to occur. Uh, and I skip this. And finally, the last pieces of evidence is was taking advantage of a breast carcinoma organoid library that we have developed in collaboration with the European Institute of Oncology, which is the hospital close by. And we did a couple of things. We look at the RAP5 expression gamma H2X. And again, we see this um, polarized distribution of RAP5 expression. And what is more fun is to look at the ability of these organoids to rotate to rotate and persistently alter their dynamic behavior. And we can classify this breast cancer real organoid in rotating versus non-rotating. We can do some omic analysis, but the most striking feature that was immediately pointed out by our bioinformatics that the RAP5 level is elevated in these rotating organoids. And they display signature of increased ISG interferon alpha, interferon DNA damage resistance signature, and increase SUS12 um, PRC2 related complex exactly as we identified. All right, I'm, I'm closing this. So we are proposing that mechanical perturbing view and in vitro um, through the fire expression leads to unjamming via flocking, flocking fluid locomotory behavior, which in turn exert vast and relevant mechanical stresses that are transferred to the nuclei with the increase the propensity of nuclear envelope rupture and the activation of this cigastin um, stimulating gene pathway. And now, more, I leave this as a teaser, we can uh, try to, to assess what is the bio, you know, the pathophysiological consequence of this transcriptional dramatic rewiring, which could be either photomorogenic, indeed, some of the signature has been associated with the acquisition of EMT with the chemo resistance, um, or in a tumor, uh, so immunogenic and uh, immunity proficient model may actually elicit a pro, an anti tumoral pro immunogenic effect. And we are currently testing these two possibilities. And uh, so this is the model. I leave you with this, and I'm be able to accept any kind of question you might have. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We do have a number of questions in the chat and um, people can keep putting those in or feel free to use the raise hand function. Um, I'm going to use my privilege here to ask the first question. So, and I might have misunderstood something, but right now your model has, you know, activate RAB5A, that induces flocking, which induces deformation. And then, um, you know, you have the downstream effects of the deformation. How do you really differentiate that from um, just directly the RAB5A inducing DNA damage? Um, 
sorry, I, I skipped, a th skipped a piece there, but right. So, so the cause and effect between the DNA damage and the collective movement, wow. um, because we have a, a paper that shows directly DNA damage resulting in movement. And so I'm just wondering about sort of cause and effect and how all these pieces right. fit together. On DNA damage, we have not precisely addressed this issue. Um, what we are uh, meaning that so far we are the correlative state. What we know, for instance, that uh, in RAP5 itself is not sufficient. You need flocking fluid in order to see the inner damage. Now, whether the damage elicit all this, uh, it's a possibility, but you still need to perturb the nuclear envelope in order for this damaged DNA to leak out. And if once we come to this, we can do a number of experiments to try to, see, to tease out the epistasis uh, analysis that you are asking. For instance, we can inhibit cigastine and look to see whether this has an impact on collective motility. It does not. Uh, I mean, I skipped the data, but that's exactly what we have done. We can look at uh, impair EMT. Does it impact on collective flocking motility? It does not. Um, it's more difficult to do the experiment that you ask, is, which is to prevent DNA damage. Because we have tried to inhibit ATR, ATM, and see whether we, we certainly do not affect uh, uh, flocking fluid motility, but it's, we are thinking how to do this because one additional thing that I haven't told you, one thing that gets pop, that gets highly elevated and upregulated, uh, it's PARP uh, proteins, which are there to, to repair in a, in a simplified view DNA damage, and we still don't know exactly what is the impact of this. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. I, a cause and effect is is hard, right? That's really hard. So I was Sometimes glad to hear what you guys are hard. thinking about Sometimes that. Very hard. Well, unless you have like some, yeah. I mean, for the cigasting, it was easy because yeah, you can knock down cigasting and see whether you have an effect on motility. Uh, uh, on on DNA damage is more complicated, I think. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm scrolling back up through the comments. I'm seeing one from uh, earlier in your talk. Claire Waterman was asking, uh, what do you make of the fact that you get down regulation of the G2M and mitotic spindle genes when you're expressing rab 5 a uh, Yeah, this is something we are currently studying because one of the dramatic effects that we have is uh, delaying cell cycle progression, which is not particularly relevant once we are dealing with the confluent dense monolayer. It becomes more relevant once the cell are in logarithmic growth. This could be due to a number of different things, including the fact that we have increased in a damage. And uh, we are trying to figure it out what is going on there. Uh, but certainly, you, you had a good eye in noticing that we have a general regulation of E2F genes, semic dependent gene. And, uh, 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 Oh, and so the cells, the five expressing cells, they tend to have a delay cell cycle. They are blocking G2M and they have a prolonged G1. But yeah, so I, I mean, I'm asking sort of if you activate this motility, do they right. stop being nasty dividing cells mm -hmm. anymore? So, so what if a, no. a, a motile no, cell not... crawls out and, and it doesn't have its, its, uh, um, its uh, uh, division dysregulated, right? You see what I'm right. saying? No, I think they have two different effects. So in all these motility acid that I have tried to talk about, uh, the impact of, of division is limited because uh, there are these, these are cell contact proliferation inhibited cells. So RAP5 does not dramatically alter this under those conditions. In addition, if we inhibit, for instance, my uh, talking about cause and consequence uh, proliferation, by various means like mitomycin C addition, there's no effect on fluidity. Whether fluidity impacts on motility, um, we have no evidence that's the case. Uh, we have done analysis of fuji like cells and the uh, extent of proliferation in control versus R5 is exactly the same under condition in which these cells are very densely impacted. So it's still unclear what's the impact of delay of cell cycle on all this phenotype. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Haroon uh, saying, 
what would you expect from a mixed culture of MCF-10 and DCIS to have more nuclear damage in one of the cell types due to mechanical stresses? Well, we haven't not done the experiment like this. We have mixed rap 5 expressing mcf with the RAP5 non-expressing mcf We do not see increased nuclear damage on the control cells, but we do see ISG activation. Mm -hmm. So why is that? There could be many different things. It looks like it is a SIGAS independent process, meaning that while the activation of ISG and cytosolic DNA response in rap expressing cell is SIGAS dependent, largely, in control, it might be SIGAS independent. Why am so you think there's a, in, uh, another pathway altogether? Right. Uh, yeah, uh, if you perturb CGAS and sting activation, you block everything, uh, both in control and in five. But the possibility is there since we know that, well, we know these require cell to cell contact. Mm -hmm. And so it requires a gap junction. And there might be transfer either of CGAM, but most likely of maybe nucleotide from one cell to another that leads to activation of the path even in the surrounding cell. But since the question was related to DNA damage, we have not seen activation of DNA damage in the flocking fluid locomotory behavior, at least not to the extent that we see in the RAP5 expressing cell. Okay, uh, great. Um, Jeff Fredberg, I think you're question was answered, but if not, um, raise your hand and we can expand on that. Uh, so then the next one uh, from Fernando asking, have you looked at um, overexpression of H3K9 methyltransferases um, and their effect on fluidization? No, we have not. This is something we had planned to do. Uh, and uh, it's in the pipeline where we have not done anything in that regard, except for the only thing we have done on H3 on PRC2 complex to inhibit PRC2 activity by knocking down. Uh, I can't remember whether we look at fluidification. I think we did, and we have not seen any major effect on fluidification. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Kalade. Uh, will RAP5A cells potentiate a stronger immune response, like an innate immune response due to greater DNA damage? Is there any prediction to that? Yeah, that's exactly the hypothesis we are working on. Uh, that's why we are generating a lot of cell lines, of murine cell lines that are syngenic, uh, meaning that they can be injected into immunoproficient mice, and thereby we can then detect whether the expression of RAP5 uh, in, under this condition elicit an innate immunity and even an adaptive immune response that actually I mean, it's intriguing to predict that this may actually be the culprit that allows an organism, a mice in this case, to get rid of the tumor that is hyperfluid and uh, hyperactivating these pathways. But that we need to test this directly. Fantastic. Uh, we have a question from Gia uh, asking, does the increased level of RAB5A correlate with the uh, IDC invasive degree? Um, and will the jammed or crowded cell layer induce activation of fluidity in only some cells? Um, saying that in, in vivo, say 20% of the cells become metastatic or fluid, uh, not all of them. Uh, all right. Let me see. So, First part of the question, yeah, indeed, RAP5 level of expression is graded right at the, as it is increases right at the region where DCIS become local infiltrative. So this is again, correlation is not causality, but this is exactly what we see. Regarding the fact that the 20% is 20% of all, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. It's not 20% of the cell within a tumor, it's 20% of tumor that have DCIS feature. And among these, 20% of all breast cancer diagnoses are DCIS. And among these, 70% will stay put and indolent, while 30% will become invasive. Now, the question is whether these two categories can be stratified based on signature that are associated to fluid versus solid, this is exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of more questions if you're okay to like hang around. Sure. It's up to you. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question is from Agatha, which is also a two-part question. What is the advantage of fluidization activity in oncogenesis when it leads to so many nuclear defects and errors? And the second part of the question is, upon escaping from the constraint of tumor mass, would you expect a decrease in RAP5 activity to reduce the nuclear damage and promote cancer cell survival? Ah, interesting. So on the first part of the question, we have, there, there are two aspects of this, uh, let me see, it doesn't matter. Uh, there are two aspects of this, of the consequence of this fluidization that needs to be taken into account. One is, all right, let me see. So one, it could be that you have a point monogenic anti-tumor, anti-tumoral effect, but there are a number of evidence, and we have been flirting also with this possibility that the activation of ISG is associated and the causally related to the acquisition of a plastic EMT phenotype, which comes along with increased chemo resistance. And we have data showing that, as I mentioned before, maybe I can even show you that, for instance, the RAP5 expressing cell have like a plastic like EMT type and they are more chemo resistance because uh, not only they proliferate less, but also the ISG response confer a chemo resistant process through mechanisms that are not really um, completely uh, worked out. So there is a possibility that all these effects uh, that are related to SIGAS uh, activation may actually be challenged or channeled toward a more protomorogenic effect. All this, however, has been tested in absence of a proficient immunological system. And all these would need to be tested in a immunogenic proficient mouse, and which we have not done yet. And that's what we are gonna be doing. Okay, fantastic. We have another question from Harun uh, asking, does high internal mobility of cells upon RAB5A expression correlate with phosphomyosin redistribution within cells or a different spatial distribution of it within the cluster or organoid? So this, this is interesting because we've been trying, I've been trying to ask many times to look at the phosphomyosin distribution in cells. We, we were either unlucky or not very good at it, and so the, a lot of these experiments are rather inconclusive. So on, on phosphomyosin, I don't know the answer because of the reason I told you, if we look at actin, I like the actin distribution, we see this very long supracellular actin cable that seem to extend across multiple cells, whether these are also actomyosin contractile cables, we have no idea, uh, but this is an interesting point. Uh, that we have not been able to address. Thank you. Um, next question is from John Ivaska, which is more technical side, says, great talk. Is the RAF5 endosome driving unjamming transition, that is the ERK activation, RAC, et cetera, dependent on EGF in your media? Because you mentioned EGFR uptake. Absolutely. It's entirely dependent on EGF in the media. If you take out EGF, everything stops. Yes, absolutely. So you need to activate EGFR somehow. Yes, you need to activate GFR. It has to be said that among the signature genes of the fluidized RAP5, there are two EGF-related genes that are skyrocketing high. Mm -hmm. So AREG, for instance, is elevated. To, but nevertheless, this is not sufficient. You need additional EGF in the system. Interesting. Fantastic. Um, we have just a, a few more questions um, from Daniel St. Johnston. What might lead to the RAB5A overexpression in the DCIS in vivo? Uh, another another sub point for us. We don't know. We, we have really no idea. We have tried many things. We have looked at whether perturbing cell mechanically in vitro uh, would actually lead to uh, some level of upregulation, whether compressive state would lead to some level of upregulation or five whether some of the treatment with the um, with pharmacological inhibitor would lead to a 5 expression. We have an observation, but is, I don't know what to make out of it. 
But whenever, for instance, we need to see this thing using pharm pharmacological means, we see an up regulation of a five, but we have no idea what whether this is specific, real. So in other words, we don't know the, how to answer this question yet. Thank you. I think that's the last question and I might have one more uh, from myself. Uh, so this question is from Kara Shields, uh, says regarding um, H3K27 methylase levels um, increasing for nuclear rigidity, do you think dysregulation of epigenome like EZH2 overexpression in breast cancer is partially a downstream effect of the increase in nuclear rigidity under mechanical stress? Yeah, that's what we like to think. Uh, we have not done much except what I, well, we, did, we have done chip set type of analysis, uh, but we have not dwell too much in the, let's say, in correlating the extent of transcription activity with the um, uh, H3K27 methyl site deposition, uh, which is something we should be doing because we have all the data. We have not done that yet. We don't know whether that happens in, uh, uh, in tumors. We have not done the staining with H3K27 yet in tumors, but this is also something that we, we, we would love to try to do. Uh, and see what's going on. Because that would address a, a key question, right? Because like, if you have mechanical perturbation, which you generate, well, at least in, in vitro, it can be short term, and rapid alteration of these uh, H3, uh, K27, H3, K9 marks, uh, uh, typically in the uh, heterochromatic field, you need like cell division to establish a sort of like epigenetic memory. If this is just yeah. the, a mechanical response, then you can think that that might not affect too much uh, uh, gene transcription. But nevertheless, once you put marks on there, then you have to take them out. And so how that is brought about, we have no idea. Thank you so much. I think we went through all the questions. I have a very nice question because it's, it's really oh. interesting. I know very less about this. Um, I was wondering when you say about nuclear rigidity, uh, it I understand it has you know components from a chromatin network and how it is connected. But how much of the influence does nuclear membrane itself has? Like, does do you think RAF five also affects? Uh, I mean, irrespective of the lamin levels, like does it affect somehow the composition of nuclear membrane itself? Right. So we have tried. Uh, beside looking at lamin, so lamin AC, for instance, are not affected at all. The only one that is regulated at the transcriptional level uh -huh. is lamin B1. We have also looked at phospholipid composition, uh, and I would have expected to see dramatic changes in phospholipid composition, not specifically the nuclei, I have to say, but globally. And uh -huh. we did not see anything actually it was remarkably similar to the okay. control cells. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, I cannot rule out the possibility that nuclear envelope uh, tensional changes are brought about or sure. associated to a fire expression, but we have no direct evidence that that. But there do. is also no connection that is known between RAF5 and. Oh. Like, okay. No, no, not direct connection that is obvious between RAF5 endosomes and the nuclear yeah. envelope uh, tensional state. It could be very indirect. Yeah. Thank which you so I would, much. Uh, what yeah. I would suspect. Yeah. All right, fantastic. We've actually got one more uh, coming in at the last minute from Haroon uh, saying that breast cancer cells that metastasize to the brain were shown to interact with astrocytes and in induce uh, CGAMP induction through the sting pathway um, and then enhancing the survival of the incoming cells. And so they're wondering if these DCIS with the RAB5 over RAB5 overexpression and the sting expression, would they have a higher collective metastasis to the brain? Uh, let's see. Now, we have not looked at that specifically. It would be interesting to see. I mean, DCIS is not a great model to look at brain metastatic dissemination. Actually, I'm not aware of a very good model uh, to look at metastatic uh, uh, breast dissemination, uh, uh, metastatic dissemination to the brain. Uh, and, and so that would be absolutely necessary to address the question that you're posing. Um, well, I would expect that the CIGAS thing and, or even the CIGAM would actually leak out uh, and that 
influence two more associated cells. Um, whether that would influence astrocytes specifically is something that would be interesting to test, but we have not done it. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. That was a really fantastic yeah. talk. I yeah. think I'm going to go back and rewatch again to Me get too. some <laughs> details I missed. <laughs> um, and on that note, I'm going to say uh, thank you, Giorgio, for the fantastic talk. Thank you to everyone who came and asked good questions. And I'm going to um, close up the uh, recording. And if anyone wants to stay after and ask any unofficial questions, feel free.